Welcome to Proof of PR, your passport to the world of public relations for Bitcoin and Web3. I'm your host, Kelly Weaver, CEO of Melrose PR, the leading provider of communications and PR strategy in our unique industry. Get ready for an inside look into the future of finance, technology, and entrepreneurship from those driving innovation in the space. Join us as we learn how they generate headlines, cut through the noise, and grow their brand awareness through media placements, press mentions, and thought leadership. These are the stories behind their success. This is Proof of PR. Welcome, everyone. Today, I am so delighted to be joined by my longtime friend and colleague, Claire Cart, who is a incredible marketer in the Web3 space. We've had the pleasure of working together over the years on multiple different initiatives and engagements, but I'm so excited to have her here. We most recently worked together when she was at the MENA Foundation. Claire, I, I know we have an exciting announcement to make, so I'd love to have you introduce yourself to our audience and welcome. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, thanks so much for having me, Kelly. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm sitting down with an old friend, so I'm excited. Uh, like you mentioned, yeah, some news to share. So I, as of the airing of this podcast, will be the CMO of Aztec Protocol. I'm really excited to join that team. I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit later about why I'm making this big move. Um, but prior to that, I was at Risk Zero, Mina Foundation, O of One Labs, and the history kind of goes back. So I have been in fintech and marketing for the last 15 years and um, yeah, have been full, solely devoted to Web3 for the last seven to eight years of my career and just absolutely love like all things marketing and, and comms and think it drives huge value for the business. So I'm excited to get down into the kind of nuts and bolts of that with you. Love it. Well, what attracts you to the Web3 industry specifically? I know you've been, you've been doing this for a long time in our industry and that's very unique. Um, what are some of the things you love about about this specific sector? I love technology, right? And then like you kind of get the financialized aspect of Web3 and it's like just kind of pouring like kerosene on a fire, right? I mean, it, it's just, it's it moves so fast. It's so dynamic. I think, you know, there's the tech part that's incredible. There's kind of the financialized part, which is like, it, it just gets like messy and exciting and it changes so quickly. So I think those two things combine make it a space that just like, it's very hard to keep up with. So it's a challenge. I love a challenge. Um, and then I think like on the tech side, I mean, some of the technology that people are building, like it, it almost shouldn't be called technology. It, it's math, right? Like we are taking math to market. And I think the idea of doing that to me is just fascinating, right? The idea that you could work with, essentially a math paper, you know, and try to commercialize something out of it. We're really having to like open up new spaces and tell new stories. Um, that's really at the frontier of what people are working on in tech. That's a great way of putting it. And I don't think I've ever heard it that way, but it's so true. Um, that's my new one catchphrase of the unique... then, <laughs> taking math Love to market. It. And you've done a great job, not just in the marketing side, but also building communities. can Is that something that's unique to our sector? And, and what are the sort of opportunities and challenges there? Um, it's unique in some ways and not in others. I think the way it's done in our industry is like very unique. Um, I think the interesting thing about the community piece is, you know, people conflate like audience and community, right? And as a marketer, that is something I feel like everyone should be really clear on. Like a community is people that you have common interests with and you do things with. And an audience is people you sort of talk to right? Um, so it's like two versus like with and for. Um, but the idea of creating a community for me as a traditional marketer, you know, I think about a funnel. And when you think about the really, really valuable people who are like engaged, you know, they're buying your product or building on your protocol, and then they're kind of evangelizing for you, you know, that's your community. Those are your community members. Um, the folks who follow you on Twitter, maybe some of them are your community members, but by and large, you know, that's an audience. So I think the way people think about community here has maybe some evolving to do to really think about like where they fit into your marketing strategy. Let's talk about your work at, at Mina. Um, and I know you, you were one of the first marketing hires at O1 Labs, I believe, and really saw the whole project through a massive evolution from when it was Coda Protocol to then Mina to, you know, the decentralization that happened with the foundation. What are you most proud of from that time? And what were the sort of is there anything from, from that time that you think was unique? I was the first non-technical hire there. So, you know, 
talk about taking math to market, you know, going into a room of cryptographers and very deeply technical engineers, you know, engineers working on um, sort of like very niche languages like Haskell, OCaml, and thinking about taking that to market. So I think the, the first thing that I was proud of was just to that point, you know, I had worked in like consumer um, fintech at SoFi and then I had worked at Ripple. Um, that was really my first time I like dove very deep into tech where I was like, okay, it's me and a couple cryptographers in a room. How am I going to tell this story? So being able to sort of like sit down with the core team, really understand like what was driving this technology, like what made it different? What could we use to kind of connect with people? And what we landed on was like the world's latest blockchain powered by participants. So it was kind of talking about, you know, how zero knowledge can make things like really good for scale and very small, very efficient. So kind of landing on that positioning that could like still speak to the technical audience, but also speak to like the broader audience of Web3 folks who want to, you know, follow along and like get excited about the potential of a project felt like a huge breakthrough. At the time, most really technical projects position themselves as very, very, very technical, right? And so the fact that we had some positioning that felt more accessible, I think was something I felt really proud of. Um, and then everything that we did really like fell in around that brand positioning. It wasn't just something we said, right? Like it really was very lightweight and it was powered by participants. So everything we did was like, let's bring the community along for the journey. Let's find opportunities for people to get involved. So at the time we had ha run these massive test nets, they were the largest outside of the Ethereum test nets that were being run. And the community that got built there, you know, there were massive rewards distributed to them. And those folks became really like long-term holders and supporters of the project. Many of them ended up, you know, creating tooling or going on to create companies within the ecosystem. So just that bootstrapping of a community and like bringing people along and giving people opportunities was more than just a marketer, you know, just kind of felt good and was really, really rewarding. Love hearing you talk about it because you you spoke about the different types of audiences. There was the, the highly technical developer audience that you did attract and reach. But then one of the things that I saw done really well by you and your team was making it accessible and harnessing the power of community. You brought in aligned incentives and you captured attention and people got it in a, in a unique way. I'll never forget one of our team members working on the MENA account many years ago was talking to a friend of hers in London and, and they were like, oh, you work on MENA protocol. We're so excited about it. Like it was like capturing this very global audience. Um, so, you know, I think, and that's a non-technical person speaking to another non-technical person. So you definitely did a fantastic job of bridging that and making it um, attract all different types of community members and then having everyone very much invested in that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's nice to hear. That's a nice story. Um, I think for me, like as someone who loves technology, but I'm not a technologist, right? I'm not technical. Like the idea of making technology exciting to non-technical people, for me, that's where I get excited, you know, because I mean, I've devoted the last six years of my career to working very specifically in zero knowledge, right? Not just Web3, not just infra, but zero knowledge. You know, the idea that one day everyone could benefit from that technology and many of those people could know about it and get excited about it and that it could really like have some sort of impact in how they interface with technology, that is super exciting to me. And so which project will reach the masses? You know, I don't know. None of us know. Um, but as a marketer, what I look for is like, okay, when I'm going to a project, like where is the biggest delta between the tech is absolutely amazing, but maybe the way they're telling the story needs work, you know, where is there that big delta? And so finding that incredible tech and then saying, okay, let's figure out how to get people excited about this and how to make it feel, you know, more accessible is just super exciting because I think the idea that like non-technical people don't care about technology, no, they do. Technology is all around us. People care, but they can't read white papers. They can't read mathematical papers. They can't maybe read the documentation, right? So like, how can we let them in on these technological revolutions and help them see how it can benefit them? You also led go-to-market for Risk Zero. Can you tell me more about, and that was your previous role, I believe. Um, yes. To, you know, we'll talk more about Aztec, but what are you proud of from that time and what was unique about that opportunity? The thing that I mentioned about finding the delta between like great tech, but like hasn't had a go-to-market function and really isn't telling their story, Risk Zero is like the perfect example of this. They 
like created a new category in zero knowledge, right? Like the general purpose EKVM. So really opening up like the addressable market of developers who can build with zero knowledge tooling. They had so many partnerships and they hadn't even announced them, right? And that's because, you know, for them, they're, they really are hardcore technologists. As soon as a POC was built, the integration was done, they were like, let's do the next one. I mean, they they weren't interested in marketing it because they just thought, let's keep building, which is great. That's an incredible attitude to have. Um, but when I came in, I was like, okay, let's assess all of the projects out there and let's actually tell the story of like the benefit that we're bringing to those integrations and customers because there's definitely other projects like them that could use risk zero but because we haven't told the story they just don't know how so as an example risk zero has like a huge percentage of the l2 market share when it comes to like Z zk integrations for um scaling but there are still more l2s out there that we'd like to integrate with right and that story hadn't been told so just going in and, and kind of making it clear to people like how dominant the technology is, the real benefits that these projects are seeing, that their users are seeing was amazing because like the work had already been done, you know, we just needed to tell the story about it. So getting to partner with the technical team and say, you know, let's get some credit for all the amazing stuff that you did was just an incredible feeling to be working in partnership like that. Did you help Risk Zero with their branding or was that did that pre-exist? Yes. Yeah, I did. So I I, I led their rebrand. You know, again, they were sort of like the tech will speak for itself, <laughs> like whatever, who cares about the website? And, you know, in many ways, they're right. The tech does speak for itself. But we also know that Web3 is very digital. It's global. People do land on your site and they evaluate your technology. And the brand didn't really feel Web3. So I think there was a certain sense of like, this seems really cool, but, you know, it wasn't speaking to the target audience. Um, and so, yeah, I led this, like, pretty insane sprint around completely doing the, redoing the brand strategy, completely redoing the visuals, and then actually rolling it out, which is, you know, like, quite a lot of work, right? Rebuilding the site, like, down to the wireframes. Um, and I also had some help from some folks that I used to work with at Mina who came came on to help me do that project who are now at great projects of their own. So it was definitely all hands on deck. We set the date of ETH Denver. We were like, we're going to get it ready for ETH Denver. Um, and yeah, I think just showing up to a conference, having people come up to you and be like, your booth is amazing. You know, we love your swag. Having the technical team, like be proud to wear the t-shirts, have people coming up to them, like wanting them. I mean, that's really motivating. It's a great feeling to just feel like part of the community that you're building in. And I think brand and visuals does that, right? Um, just kind of communicates in like the blink of an eye, like, hey, we're, we're one of you. I didn't know that before, but I'm not surprised to hear you say that because the branding is so, is it's striking. Like it's very um, appealing and it's definitely very forward facing. And so I was like, I bet Claire is the brains behind this. <laughs> they, I, so kind of a, I don't know if we like really rewind back to how I got started. Um, when I went to college, I was super like, I'm going to study computer science. And I had been a huge math geek in high school. I think I had the credentials, but when I showed up to the computer science department, I was just so intimidated. I ended up going to the art history department. I don't know how those two things are like my two interests, but um, I went to the art history department and I was like, oh, these are my people. You know, I feel really at home here. So I was an art history major, studio art minor. Um, and I feel like, you know, I'm, I try to bring like art and art history and like kind of like really like strong visuals into all these projects that I work on because you know, we're humans. People connect with that kind of stuff, right? It's visceral. So maybe people don't know what a general purpose EKVM is, but at least when they land on the site, they're like, huh, this is beautiful or intriguing or, you know, it, it stirs an emotion in me. Um, so yeah, I think doing the branding for projects is like, anytime I'm talking to a project, I'm like, can I do your branding? <laughs> you know? So I think it like really scratches an itch I have that goes like way back to me being like 18, 19 art history major, you know, I worked in the arts in New York for a little bit. Um, so I have this connection to the arts that I think pulls through in, in some of my work. Well, br great branding evokes a feeling exactly as you said. It's like a little je ne sais quoi where you're drawn to something, but you don't, you can't necessarily explain why, but it lends itself with le legitimacy, credibility, and attracts the right types of people 
where they may not even be, it's more of a subconscious as opposed to a conscious thought, perhaps. And I know you ran the the rebrand for Mina. Kind of going back to your point, I mean, people joke like, oh, the industry runs on vibes, the industry runs on vibes. I mean, yes and no, like, no, there's a lot more to this industry. But yes, in some ways it does, right? Because we're all like remote and then we're popping up at these conferences and conferences are in person, they're physical. And so the visuals of a project really matter and developers really, if they're going to build on your platform, they're like literally associating their personal identity with your brand identity. And there's like no deeper connection. So to have a brand that feels like, you know, outdated or like isn't bringing the vibes, it's, it's not good, you know, and like each set of developers wants their own vibes. So you can totally like do what's unique to you. But I think you have to know what's unique to you, right? And when I joined Risk Zero, I like sat down with the founders and I did this branding exercise I put founders through where I literally give them like 160 like words, like adjectives. And I'm like, we're going to just use this as a conversation starter. Like, let's talk about these. Let's find ones we have strong reactions to, right? And, you know, they're words like trustworthy, um, elegant. I mean, they're, they're all across the board and just hearing them talk through their reactions to these words, you start to really evoke like feeling and meaning. And then if you can package that into visuals, it's super powerful. So the brand at risk zero is a hundred percent the work of the founders. I just sort of like elicited it and then said, this is what I think it looks like, right? What you told me, I think it looks like this and kind of held a mirror to them. And then they were like, oh, yeah, that that does feel like, like how we feel about our project. And that's the most powerful moment in branding, right, where people feel connection. And, and I think what, what they started to see was like the high-quality builders who wanted to come to them also felt connection. And that resonance is – it's just super powerful. I love that. The other thing that I noticed about the Risk Zero site is that you had some very elegant layered marketing integrations built into that site so that you could understand. Well, I, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I imagine that those are for reasons like understanding who's landing on the web page, where are they going, all of that. Can you talk a little bit about some of those? Kind of looking at where I started when I joined the project there wasn't much, we, we didn't know who was coming to our site, which is an issue. We also know that we're marketing developers or like decision makers at Web3 and for companies. You know, we don't want to overload them with marketing. I mean, they're there to basically get to the docs and evaluate things for themselves. That being said, if you spend like five minutes on our docs, like you probably want to give us your email because if we're going to serve you good content about, hey, here are video tutorials, you know, really useful stuff that's going to help, like you probably want those. So for us, it was all about kind of like setting up moments where we knew someone was really highly qualified. Like if you spend five minutes reading our docs, like you're interested. And then it's like, how can we ask for your email in a way that doesn't feel intrusive? And then the content that you're getting through those emails is actually helping you, right? It's not marketing to you in a sense. It's answering your questions. It's helping. And so that was also like a really big initiative just to say, okay, we know this great developer traffic is coming. We also know there's traffic of just people who are like curious, you know, maybe they're sort of like web three onlookers. Maybe we don't want their email, right? Cause do they really need a tutorial about like <laughs> how to get started with a ZKVM? Like probably not, right? That's probably going to be junk to them. So just kind of figuring out who's who. I mean, that's marketing at its finest right there. I mean, that's so elegant yeah, how yeah. you described it, but it's so true. It's thinking about, okay, what's the user experience going to be like? How can I meet them where they're at? How can I add value? I mean, hearing you talk yeah. about it, you're putting yourself in your audience's shoes, depending on the, who the audience is and thinking, okay, how can I serve them value here without spamming them? Because, you know, so I think you're already thinking three steps ahead of most people as it relates to, you know, like how to meet people where they're at. So before I got into Web3, I was in like, I say traditional fintech. I mean, it was a startup at the time. I, I started my career in fintech at SoFi. We were like 20 people in a room, right? There were people who like sat on the floor. They IPO'd several years ago. So like a real like kind of zero to 60 story. But, you know, that was like a very performant marketing org, right? Like, yeah, we were a startup, but we were acquiring customers at scale and moving them through a funnel. So I think like the fundamentals 
of that experience, just understanding, yeah, you probably actually don't want every lead that comes to your website. You just want qualified ones. And then what do you do with the qualified ones, right? How do you move them closer to like a purchase decision? Um, so, I mean, I, I, I credit that foundation with making me, you know, a marketer that really thinks about like the marketing fundamentals, which I think in web three, you know, because, well, because of a lot of things that we can talk about, I think, you know, really strong marketers are maybe a little reluctant to stake their career on web three. And I completely understand that reluctance. You don't always run into people who are like, I'm a classically trained marketer. You know, I can understand any audience. I can apply these fundamentals. And I think that's needed here because developers or whomever, they're, you know, they're just like everybody else, right? You just have to kind of understand them and meet them where they're at. So let's cut to today. Tell me about what drew you to Aztec, um, your CMO. Congratulations. Uh, What was unique about this opportunity that was too good to pass up? I mean, I'm speaking to other marketers here, right? You're like a comms professional. So like a true CMO role in web Web three. I mean, there's very few positions of that like stature, right? Where you're on the executive team, you know, you have a team under you, you have a really big remit. And I felt like I was ready for that in my career. I mean, I'm, depending on how you count it, you know, I'm 20 years in, 15 years in on tech, like 10 years in on Web3. And I, I felt like I'm ready for that. I love leading teams. I've done it before. I also felt really ready to like take a really ambitious project to market again. I mean, doing that for Mina, like telling a completely new story, which in many ways, I mean, Aztec is an L2, but it's the only L2 with native privacy. So that's going to be a game changer for the industry and getting to take that to market. But privacy is also really tricky. Like that is going to be such a maze to navigate. And I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait. Like that's the kind of stuff that gets me out of bed in the morning. And then I think like the kind of the, the zoom out, like the bigger picture is when I got into Web3, I was sort of like, that's cool, but can't everyone see everything you do? And that's kind of creepy, you know, and I, I, like, I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know where that sense came from. Like, I mean, I'm a woman, right? Like the idea of someone like stalking all my financial transactions, like kind of freaked me out. But then like people were like, no, no, like it can't be traced. But it's like, no, it definitely can, especially with like, you know, machine learning and AI, right? It's like, yeah, someone can connect those dots. So then I got into ZK, right? And I was sort of like, oh my God, this solves the trilemma, right? Like this solves everything and we're going to get privacy because the regulatory landscape, most projects have not pursued the privacy aspect of ZK. It's been like this North Star that I just didn't know which project could actually have like a good chance at bringing like a privacy focused product to market. And a lot of great privacy projects have shut down. Um, But I think Aztec has like the right investors, they have enough capital, they have the right team, they have the right mindset to like really bring this to market. And I think it's going to be transformative for the industry. So kind of like that thread all the way back to realizing, oh yeah, like Bitcoin sounds cool, but hmm, this immutable ledger, like, I'm not sure, (laughs) you know, kind of that thread bringing it all the way through to today when they approach me, I just, I mean, yeah, it's like this deep interest of mine that I've had for, for quite some time. And I think about six months ago, I like secretly, I didn't tell anyone, but in my head, I said, I want to devote like the next chapter of my career to like privacy preserving Web3 technologies. And so Like I was fortunate enough to be asked to join like a board of a privacy focused project and then Aztec came along. So it kind of just felt like everything was converging on. Yeah, I'm going to go try to market privacy preserving technologies. I mean, I love that journey and story. And it's so true. When I first discovered the technology, I was like, but wait, someone can just look at Etherscan and see how much is in my wallet. I don't understand (laughs) and can figure out how much how much you're being paid for something. It's like, could, what can you imagine if we were just like, oh, okay, everyone can see into your Chase bank account. I don't think that would fly, you know? So, it, and it's been this promise of blockchain, oh, well, but we can embed privacy through zero knowledge and other technologies. But to, to date, um, that's just been a hypothetical, really. And so I'm with you. I can't wait to see this this story kind of unfold and progress and wouldn't it be nice if we have the the sort of the beauty of decentralization with all of the you know the protections of privacy as i thought on it as i thought about the new opportunity 
because it, it wasn't easy to leave the team at Missy Row. Like they're incredible. And I loved my time there, right? So it was really connecting with like this deep desire to figure out how to bring a privacy product to market. I just kept thinking like privacy, I think, is like a human right. I don't know if it's like codified as a human right. I mean, I'm I'm not like that's not my expertise, right? But it feels, at least in a digital age, like it, it should be codified as a human right. And then we all give up rights of ours for different reasons, right? So maybe in certain circumstances, you decide to give up your privacy or give up your right to privacy because of whatever. But I think fundamentally, you should have access to it. That's not possible. If you want to engage with this like incredible new technology space of Web3, you have to forfeit that. There's no compromise. And I think that that is like a fundamental issue that will hinder adoption. There is no way, you know, all my friends already think I've ruined my career by being a Web3 marketer, right? <laughs> like still to this day, they're all like, we don't know what you're doing. Um, but if I went to any of them and I was like, yeah, yeah, on chain, all this cool stuff. And then I was like, oh, but like everyone can see what you're doing. They'd be like, absolutely not. There's no way I'm going to do that. So I think it's this huge barrier to adoption as well. Like the philosophical stuff is there for me, but then also the practical side of like, how do we bring a billion people on chain? I don't think we're going to convince them. Yeah. Everyone can see what you do. Are there any great tools or tricks or things that you love to integrate over and over um, that you feel like are no brainers for marketers, especially in our industry to consider just because you, you have worked on several different projects and, and integrated with different providers and, and services. I totally respect the like small team that's doing everything on Google sheets. I think as soon as you can integrate HubSpot, you should go for it. And again, maybe this is like my background coming from FinTech, right? And being like, we need all this data and analytics and everything needs to be connected, but it's a big spend. Um, but it just gives you so many efficiencies. Like having a developer CRM is pretty game changing. Um, having a CRM for your BD leads is pretty game changing. Um, not just in terms of your ability to like move people through the funnel and understand them, but also your ability to communicate internally about marketing's value and progress, which, you know, we all know like the cycles, right? The up and down, like, you know, it's a bull market. Everyone wants to hire a marketer. When it's a bear market, are you going to have a job? And so I think like as a marketer, just thinking about, can these tools help me showcase my value internally? So that, you know, hopefully despite the fluctuations, like you keep your job because people realize, hey, no matter what the cycle is, there are people looking for our tech and we're finding them and capturing them and moving them down the funnel. So for me, I think it goes back to like a very unsexy tool, which is HubSpot. Self-serving question, but a lot of our audience is PR professionals. What has your oh, experience yeah. been like working with PR? What are, you know, what is your sort of view on PR as it relates to the marketing stack? When, in your experience, is it the right time to be thinking about um, PR? PR, for me, is like one of the most valuable tools. So, I mean, you know, you and I have worked together before. And, like, I, I feel like for me, you know, the project is bringing on a marketer to kind of, like, get in the bubble of the project in many ways, right? It's deeply technical. So it's like, how do I bring this math to market? Um when you work with a PR agency, you know, their whole job is to be outside the bubble of your project and to really pay attention to industry trends and to understand, like, how to make people care about what you're building. Because for any Web3 project, I mean, you can't, like, pivot on a dime, right? Like, the talent is pretty specific. Like, the technology is pretty deep. So it's not like you can just pivot all the time. So it's more about like understanding what's going on in the market and how you can kind of tell your story in a way that matches like the mood or the moment. Um, so for, for me in my career, I think, you know, sometimes I go very, very deep heads down on the project I'm working on. And then the PR team I'm working with is like, okay, that sounds great. You know, here's what's, here's what people really care about right now. Here's what people are talking about. Here's what they want to hear about. And then how do you kind of insert with that? Because if you just go to market with whatever message you think is the most interesting, again, it's not meeting people where, where they're at, right? For me, PR is essential. I think it depends if you're thinking about like, you know, maybe 
bringing people on for a project, right? Like, hey, help me announce this funding round versus like a full retainer. I think, you know, bringing someone on a full retainer, like you do have to be invested in the relationship, like help them come up to speed on your product, your roadmap, your positioning. Um, But once you get in lockstep with them, like I think it's money very well spent. Like having been behind all the Google Analytics panels for many, many, many years, I mean, there's like no bigger day of inbound traffic than the day you have a press release and get coverage. There just isn't. Nothing else drives that kind of momentum. Well, I love hearing you say that. The only thing that I would add is about the spokespeople. You do need the buy-in of the, especially if you're, you know, beyond the announcement. It is cha- it can be challenging to engage PR if you don't have spokespeople at the ready who are willing to speak to a variety of topics because part of what the value is is really the the brand building and the being a resource for reporters and the relationship there. And so something that makes our job certainly more effective and and easier is having spokespeople who are like bought in. And I know that you've done a good job of convincing, you know, fellow leaders amongst the teams that you've worked on about why they should be spending not just the money, but the time. The time to integrate, build the relationship with the team, but also having the leadership bought in. I mean, let's say the marketing executive is bought in. That's great. But like Coindesk doesn't want to hear from me about infrastructure in Web3, you know, so. Well, they might now that you're CMO. (laughs) Maybe, maybe, maybe now, but like, you know, no one's ever like, and the CMO said this, you know, like, so um, getting the marketing team bought in, like, that's great. But ultimately, like, you can't place that in the media, right? You have to place like a founder, another C-suite, you know, maybe someone who has a really strong community, like, reputation who's, you know, working on the product side or the BD side or something like that. So yeah, I think, and getting that buy-in is not easy. I think for anyone who's watching this, who's like thinking about, you know, PR retainer, I mean, my thing, and I think this is why you and I, I felt always collaborated really well was, you know, I never want to oversell the team on PR. I want to tell them like, let's invest like right size and let's see results. And then if we feel like we want to invest more, we can, right? So I think like where some PR engagements in my experience go south is you start with this giant blown out retainer and then you're like, oh, are we getting value from this? You know, cut. Are we getting value from that? Cut. And you end up with this really shrunken down thing, which is fine. But like people internally are like, oh, we cut a bunch of services, right? As opposed to like starting with the thing at first, the little kernel, killing it, delivering a ton of value, and then being like, oh, okay, maybe we also want, you know, some executive thought leadership support, or maybe we also want this type of support, right? And kind of like building after you have kind of that core foundation. Completely. And making sure that the whole entire team understands what is possible from PR. I always say that our whole job is basically meeting or exceeding expectations. If the expectations are outsized, then we're never going to win with the initiative. If the expectations are reasonable, then hopefully we're able to to meet or exceed those and make everybody happy. And it really, you know, I think once you feel, once the executives feel the value, see the impact, as you said, from the Google Analytics of that, you know, that traffic that you can't, you couldn't pay for, that's where it it becomes like a beautiful thing and they see the value. Um, Especially when you don't, you know, because I know you've worked with a lot of teams that are very technical where they may be a little bit shy or they have zero ego whatsoever. They're really interested in just bringing the technology forward. Um, So it has required some coaching from your part, I know, to get everyone comfortable and excited about those types of opportunities. You're not working with people who are prideful. They're really, they're really passionate about the technology. I feel like the teams that you've worked with, like all have that in common. You know, there are so many different types of founders in Web3, but yeah, I do tend to gravitate towards the folks who are like, I mean, if you could get them on a big stage, everyone would just be attracted to their message because they are so credible, so deep in their knowledge, right? But they don't seek those out. So they're sort of these like hidden gems. Um, But yeah, for them, they might have a certain perception of like, well, over-mediatizing myself is going to ruin my credibility. Because, you know, think about it. A lot of these folks come out of academia. When you're in academia, I mean, you might speak at conferences, but you're not like trying to go on Bloomberg, you know, as an academic, like for the most part. So, and, you know, doing something like that, like kind of in the more traditional media, mainstream media might 
actually be seen as like destroying your credibility because you're not able to go deep into your message, right? You have to be a more top line. So I think, yeah, it's, it's super tough to work with founders like that. If anybody's listening to this and they have one of those founders um, that they're working with, like, please reach out because there is so much value in getting those folks to engage, but it is really tough. And you have to kind of also empathize with like how they view themselves, their personal brand, um, all of those things. What are some of the platforms that you think are the most valuable um, for the audiences that you've served over the past few years? For example, you know, Twitter or X um, versus, you know, like a Discord community or Telegram or LinkedIn? Like, how do you view different sort of social and community channels in how they play a role in our industry? It depends on what type of people you're trying to hire. But when you think more about like the employer brand side, so this is if, if you're going outside of like purely marketing the tech, right? Like your company is now big enough where you need to have a corporate brand and you need to maybe recruit talent on LinkedIn. Um, so I think for me, like that's one that you need to get set up and you need to sort of maintain it, but you can be more hands off and not invest in it until you really get to a huge scale where you're like, you know, maybe Chainlink has like a really active LinkedIn profile, right? Cause they need to recruit and retain like a lot of people, you know, customer success managers, integration managers. Um, when I think about like earlier stage projects, which most projects in web three are like pre-seed seed a, there's very few projects that are like B or a found product market fit. Um, X is still like the king. <laughs> um, and I think for me, it's like really the awareness layer, right? So it's like very much at the top of the funnel. Um, Discord for me, I think some people view it as top of funnel, but depending on what kind of project you're building, let's say you have a huge Discord. Okay, that could be good, but what's in there? Is it signal or noise? And I think Discord needs to be super protected as signal. Twitter can be noise, right? Like it can be a little noisy. You can have some fun. No one is expecting you to like show up with like the most hard hitting content on Twitter. I mean, you should, you should be valuable to your audience, but you can also have some fun, right? It's more casual. Um, but yeah, when you get down to Discord, like I think you better be delivering signal there. So I think folks who try to like pack their discord and make it really noisy, I mean, I think it's a little bit of a misstep. And then there's Farcaster, which like I love. And actually we've ha we had success at Risk Zero because there was a really specific like ZK channel. But my only hesitation there is, you know, there's always kind of like the social media challenger du jour. So I don't know. I feel like, you know, I could go back to being at SoFi where – like everyone I worked with on the team was like, we have to be on Snapchat. We have to be on Snapchat. And actually Snapchat was a really good like platform for us. But, you know, I think today like some brands are showing up on Snapchat, not others. Um, then, oh my gosh, I mean so many brands or so many platforms have come along, right? And even just in Web3, it's like Mastodon, Farcaster. Um, for a while there was um, – what was the one where it was like all audio? Oh, Clubhouse. Clubhouse, Clubhouse. Clubhouse, yeah. But then it became – basically Twitter Spaces took over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They never but for a while, like, Twitter Spaces like, instead of Clubhouse. But during the pandemic, yes, right. it was Clubhouse. So. It was Clubhouse. And yeah. so, like, everyone was like, well, Mark Andreessen's on Clubhouse, so we all have to figure out Clubhouse. So as a marketer, I was like, okay, I need to figure out Clubhouse, right? And need to invest in Clubhouse. And, you know, now Clubhouse, I mean, I don't know what they're up to, but nobody is, like, saying it's a must add in terms of like platforms. So I think for Farcaster, I'm super optimistic. I love what they're doing. But, you know, as a marketer, when you think about, okay, I have these very limited resources, I would say like pour it into X and maybe do tests on places like Farcaster and other places where you might, you know, see if you can pick up some signal. What are your thoughts on X as it relates to the founders on the teams, like the executives using it um, for brand awareness versus the brand's brand itself. The founders have to be on Twitter. They X, sorry. Like they have to. And this is also super tough, right? Because it's like a lot of folks don't want to. And, you know, it's, it's also hard. It's like, okay, you're deeply focused on this technology and now I'm going to like throw you into a dumpster fire. That's going to distract you from doing your great technical work. But, you know, I think, like, if, if you're a marketer and you're trying to work with one of those founders, don't approach it as, like, Joe Schmo on Twitter. Okay, you need to get on there. You need to look at everything. You need to 
make and schedule your own tweets, like provide executive support, you know? So go in, curate some lists for them, like bookmark tweets that you think are relevant for them, curate who they follow, you know, gain their trust so you can actually like posts of other other like top founders, people who are driving topics and conversations. And then, you know, try to schedule like maybe 30 minutes, two times a week to be like, let's respond to these and let's tweet this out and have it there and have it ready. So I think it's a must do, but if you approach it as like, they're just going to be an average Twitter user, but on behalf of the brand, like you're not going to succeed. You have to provide the executive support. Fantastic tips. Love that. And we often do this. We do the same from a PR standpoint. It's such an incredible tool to be flagging, hey, reporters are asking for this, or like we're seeing this trend play out in real time. You might want to consider hopping into this thread. And boy, does it work. You know, so I think your your tip to make it manageable for these folks that might, you don't, you do want it to be authentic. And oftentimes it, it, there's resistance because it doesn't, it feels inauthentic, but to make it more manageable um, and approachable and valuable, all the tips that you just laid out are just fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I think about it as like the signal versus noise thing, right? Like Twitter's noisy. If you want your executive to be on Twitter, try to find the signal for them. And give it to them, right? Be like, here's all the signal. (laughs) How can we engage with these very good conversations? And I think I've, I want to say I brought a couple executives to market in that, you know, I've worked with them when they were like pre-Twitter and then like post-Twitter growing their audiences. I think for me, what I've noticed is once they find their voice, once they feel like they have the right conversations to follow, they're getting people responding to their tweets. They actually like, like it and they feel like, okay, I'm in the right place. Like I found my niche. Right. So I think helping people find their niche versus like, you know, trying to get them to be something that they're not, um, like you're not going to have success with that. Right. So it's really about helping that executive find their voice and then making Twitter actually a valuable place that they can enjoy which I know seems like tough, but it's, it's doable. I want to wrap things up here because we're coming to the end of our time. I knew that today's conversation would be valuable, but you've absolutely blown it out of the water. So thank you for for all of your incredible nuggets of wisdom. Uh, So, so valuable for this audience. Thank you. Of course. Thank you for having me on. I know I'm (laughs) just, yeah, I love, I always love like chatting with you and like the insights you have into the industry too, are just like incredible. Thank you. Well, you're such a delight to work with because you you see the whole big picture and you understand all the the stakeholders, including you know the the on the external service providers and what we navigate, as well as internally the dynamics and getting buy in. So I think you have a very unique perspective, and you've done a phenomenal job uh, at you know all the places that you've been. I love the rebrands that you did, both for Mina and Risk Zero. Um, and I'm so excited to see what this next chapter looks like at Aztec. Um, you know, I'll be following along closely here. And I just know that whatever you put your mind to, it's going to be incredible. So really c- huge congratulations for this next this next little, you know, section of your career here. So excited for you. And the industry is so lucky to have you. Thank you so much. And how can people keep up with you? Yes, I'm easy to reach. <laughs> um, so my name is Claire Cart, Claire with the C, Cart with a K, and my Twitter and Telegram are Claire Cart. That's it. It's it's easy. There's nothing fancy. It's uh, somehow, yeah, I got my name and I've stuck with it, and it's really easy to reach me. And I I respond to most people who reach out with like some legitimate question. I actually love talking to marketers because we all have like really cool challenges on our hands. Well, thank you for all you do for everybody and um, really appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks for tuning in to Proof of PR. This episode was brought to you by Melrose PR, the leading provider of communications and PR strategy for Bitcoin and Web3 innovators. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen today. To stay up to date on upcoming guests and news, visit proofofpr.com or follow us on Twitter at Proof of PR. Until next time, keep learning, innovating, and hodling.